when I met back at Disney, um, I was there for 20 years, Chris was there for 10 years. Um, Chris now is a product design practice lead at Quantity, which is a boutique internet design agency in Silicon Beach in Santa Monica. Um, before that, he was at Pandango for two and a half years, 10 years at Disney, um, where he was a UI UX designer. But he wasn't always an information architect. In fact, he was studying anthropology as an undergrad and then urban planning as a graduate student at UCLA. And then uh, after graduating, he went to a few different agency positions. And um, that's where he kind of discovered that he was really kind of interested in and cared about designing the ideal user experience. But uh, also, he discovered at the same time, I think, that he was really bad at coding. So, uh, which led him really to then become an information architect and he started creating sitemaps and wireframes before he came to Disney and then slowly it dawned on him that he wanted to become a designer. So, with that intro, please uh, give a really warm welcome to Chris Chandler. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, intro, I appreciate that. Um, so the, the topic of the talk tonight was about adaptive design. That was the, the topic that, that uh, Terry and I discussed. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Do I just make a deep sound when I... When you're <laughs> uh -oh. oh, hey, what Right, is about adaptive design versus responsive design. Are you guys familiar with those terms? Sort of familiar with those terms? Great. Uh, so really quick, um, here's a little diagram just to talk a little bit about what uh, responsive design means. Uh, really a term invented, created uh, by Ethan Marcotte, a uh, great book on responsive design, great uh, articles on uh, List Apart that you can read about uh, the whole theory of responsive design. The concept is sort of design once and your design responds right, to the, to the uh, device, to the screen size, to the resolution uh, of whatever device is displayed on it. One design that responds to all of those choices. Adaptive design is a, is a sort of different approach to the similar problem. The idea in adaptive design is that your design is actually adapted to different devices Somewhere on the server, uh, uh, you do a detection, what kind of device am I looking at, uh, and you decide what design to serve up to that device, right? So, this is, oops, sorry. I'm actually not going to spend much time talking about that, because honestly, as designers, you have much bigger problems than responsive versus adaptive. Trust me. Trust me on this. Um, so, what are the fundamental challenges of design online? I'm going to come back to adaptive and responsive a little bit, but I, I want to start with what I think are the fundamental challenges, the kind of things that have kept me going for a long time. This is the most important fundamental challenge to designers, which is you don't know what your user is doing at the time that they use your design. When you're a print designer, right, you get to control every single thing about that design. Right? You control it. You can control the paper, the ink, right? the printing, the technology, all things under your control. It's exactly the opposite in the online world. And I'm, I'm so jealous of all you digital natives who don't have to learn this the hard way. Right? You already know this. But this is the, this is the fundamental problem. Right? You don't know what kind of computer they're using. You don't know if they're on a Mac, a PC, a Unix box. Right? You don't know what OS version they're running. And you don't know what browser they're running. All of these things impact your design, right? All of these things impact your design. We spent a ridiculous amount of time uh, in all of the jobs I've had for the last 15 years trying to make sure that our experiences are cons somewhat consistent, right? For someone who might be on a Windows uh, machine running Internet Explorer 7 and uh, on a Mac running Safari or a Mac running Chrome, right? All of these things they have these little annoying quirks, right, that you have to take into account as designers. So in some ways, we've been doing adaptive design forever, right? We've been, there are hacks and workarounds and ways to make the CSS uh, work the same across those browsers. 
we're in a little bit of a golden age for this. This was a much bigger problem before, but it's still a problem now. Right? You still have to test your designs uh, on different browsers. And this is a thing, at the end of a project, uh, it doesn't matter too much too much you're in school, but when you're creating things that are consumer facing, right, that literally anybody in the world can look at, you'd be amazed how many times you get complaints of, I can't uh, make this work, it looks terrible, screenshots, the buttons don't work, this is all just the like, the horrible mess uh, that we're in because we don't control the context of use of the users. And, germane to the question of responsive versus adaptive design, you don't know what kind of screen they have. I mean, the original web browser didn't even support images, right? There are computers out there that still only show text. Um, sometimes people think about uh, accessible design, designing for people with disabilities, especially visual impairments, right, as, as, a, as a browser that only displays text. One way to approximate how your design is going to look to somebody who might use it in a screen reader, for example, is by using a text-only browser. Called one, there's several out there, but one is called Lynx that's been around forever, that will show you the plain uh, vanilla HTML of your design. So these are your fundamental problems, right? The context of whether you should use a responsive design or adaptive design is all about this problem. I can't tell what my actual user is doing. I'm not in control of that. And here's the other part of it, right? The users don't care. They're not forgiving. They don't say, oh, well, they didn't realize that I haven't updated you know, my browser lately. Uh, I saw a great tweet the other day that was like, hey, remember when you're home to update your parents' browsers. <laughs> Do yourselves a favor as, as professional web developers and make sure to update their browsers because they're part of, they're part of the problem, right? <laughs> Uh, the people who can't update their browsers either don't know how or are can't because of corporate policies. And so that's another part of this problem. You have this long trailing edge, right? A long tail of old browsers that suck, right? So as I started thinking about responsive versus adaptive design, and Terry asked me to think a little bit about uh, uh, my, my career and give some examples, I thought I, I did, took a little bit from the Wayback Machine and over, in the course of 10 years at Disney, uh, I redesigned, or I was really what I should say is I was part of a team, um, because most of your design work in life uh, is going to be part of a team, uh, that redesigned DisneyWorld.com at least three different times, depending on how you count, maybe five different times. Here's what it looked like in 2003 when I started uh, at Disney. Here's the homepage of DisneyWorld.com. There were probably $500 million worth of bookings going through this site at the time. So just, you know, it looks a little bit like a toy, like a joke, right? It's amazing how this stuff ages. And my first project uh, was, a, was really exciting. It was called Quick Wins. I don't know why. Who comes up with project names inside of a corporation? Quick Wins. So we minorly, we, you know, we made minor changes to the design. Um, one of the things, just uh, to talk about adapt or respond, is uh, back in the day, uh, we had a philosophy uh, that we called, uh, and I loved it when I got to Disney, by the way, called graceful degradation, right? Which meant that as designers, what we aimed for was the most recent browser on the fastest internet connection with all the plugins necessary, right? We were like, hey, we're Disney, we're gonna aim for the top of the line, and then we'll just try to make sure that if you don't have those things, it doesn't fail too badly. Right? So here, here was an idea. This, this is not very graceful. It's definitely a degradation. Right? Uh, uh, sorry, you don't have the flash player. You've got to go in and load that. Right? So just a little, you know, nightmare about how horrible it was to be a web designer back then when we had to design both ways uh, uphill in the snow. Uh, you understand? So um, at the time, the argument was not about responsive versus adaptive. The argument was about graceful degradation versus progressive enhancement, right? How should you approach this fundamental problem that you don't control the user experience yourself, right? The experience of your designs is sort of co-created by this context. So as I've just described it, graceful degradation is the idea that we're gonna start with the top of the line and make these assumptions and then hope that it doesn't break too badly. Whereas progressive enhancement, I think is a little bit more, which one, by the way, nobody really practices graceful degradation anymore. Progressive enhancement being the idea that you build up from the lowest common denominator, make sure that that experience is what you want, 
and then you build up and add to that based on people having more recent browsers and better, faster internet connections. All right, so this was my first real um, redesign of DisneyWorld.com, March 2004. Oh, I should have, uh, speaking of responsive and, and adaptive, I should have mentioned here that, you know, back in the day, we, it was so simple for us, right? We designed for this resolution, this VGA resolution, 640 by 480. And even that, like I said, top of the line, um, uh, monitor, 640 by 480. I was so excited when we went to this design. It was 1024 by 768. That was really a big moment for me. Um, I don't want to get into it too much, but I will say uh, doing this little history project has also brought uh, up a whole bunch of uh, really stupid things that we did that are like sort of embarrassing now. So thank you for bearing with me. For for example, we had a lot of complaints about how come you're how come there's all this uh, white space, useless space on both sides of your design when I pull it up in a browser with uh, a screen with better resolution, right? And so we took that literally, and so we went to a lot of trouble to make sure that our design uh, actually, instead of doing the natural, normal, expected browser behavior of centering the design, that it was actually flush uh, left. This was really stupid. I mean, you can just tell how stupid it is looking at it now, right? It looks a lot stupider this way than centered on the screen. Um, and that's something that became obvious, right, as more and more people had better screens. It's like this design decision uh, really came back to, every time I look at it now, it's just it's horrible, it's embarrassing, it's terrible. Um, here's, the, here's the second major redesign uh, of, of DisneyWorld.com. The first, the first one, the quick wins, right? That was the, that was the full uh, redesign. Um, I think you can see, right, it's sort of thematic. Uh, it's, a, it's an online travel agency. Um, so, as far as responding or adapting, I'll take another uh, take of what that means, right? So instead of, uh, uh, we basically decided we want to look exactly like Travelocity or Expedia or something, right? If we're going to respond to what the users already know how to use, uh, which is the design of this. Um, still, uh, I'm not going to say too much about it. We're still at 1024 by 768, um, and then finally, uh, uh, five years later, uh, here was here was the third major redesign of the site um, uh, from May 2012. Still at 1024 by 768. I want to take a little sidelight into, uh, I was recently talking to somebody about A-B testing, and I have one really awesome example in my career about where A-B testing actually worked the way I wanted it to work. I don't know, I guess familiar with A-B testing? So the idea is you, you make two designs, and you have the web server split the traffic, so it serves version A and version B, and then you check to see which one works better. And I don't know how to tell you this, but, most of the time, as designers, you're going to be bitterly disappointed in your users. <laughs> it's pretty horrible how many times the bad, uglier looking thing wins. It's terrible. But, and I don't mean to ruin the surprise, but here, here's an example where, where the design won. So, uh, here we've got uh, that, that home page of the version of it that I, that I was talking to you about. And you can see like lots of stuff. I've already explained like, why we have this big travel widget covering the photograph. And you can see this part here, which is all about the marketing and the sales department telling us, the designers, that what people really wanted was to see all these specials and promos, and I love this, get a free vacation planning DVD. That was old then, by the way. That's, you know, who has a DVD? I don't even, I don't even know what that means anymore. Um, but they insisted that it be there. Well, we had some different ideas. We've done a lot of research with users, and what we realized was that people were spending thousands of dollars to go on a Disney World vacation. Right? They would save for years. You could, you, if you're going to stay at a Disney hotel in Orlando, you could easily spend five thousand dollars for a week. Right? And so, what do people want out of that? What they don't necessarily want or need out of that is show me how much that's going to cost right away, because I'm going to paint. Right? Right? So, but what they want to know is what is the experience going to be? Right? They want to go to Disney because they want to have that magical experience. They know what they're going to get. Um, and so lucky the Disney files are are. Uh, Wonderful, beautiful, totally crazy. Um, I don't understand. I don't think there's any other fans. Maybe Apple, Apple fans are, are close. But here was our here was our proposal, and the idea was we have all this amazing photography. Why are we covering it up with widgets? Right? Why are we showing sho shoving all this like promo stuff in your face? Way too many choices. 
And the most controversial thing, as I said, is we totally changed the way, the appearance, the way that the booking module looked. Right? And people were worried, right? Like, well, how are users going to react when you do this? Well, the A-B the A-B testing story was a big win. This version totally kicked the other version's butt. And this is actually a version of this homepage is still live. It's actually on Disney World Arc. I mean, things have, uh, have had some more quick win projects, I think, since then. But this is something that's still uh, alive and kicking. Then I went to Fandango, and when I got to Fandango, I was so obsessed with this resolution problem, right? I just thought, like, I looked at all the statistics about our users and what screen sizes they had. I was, was on this, this idea that screen sizes were just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. We're going to have better and better resolution. So we designed the Fandango homepage at uh, 1280 by 768. Looks really nice on a big monitor. But a funny thing happened. What do what you, what you what do you suppose happened? Here's what happened. <laughs> yeah, something, something happened along the way to that bigger and bigger beautiful screen size thing that was going on. So um, for uh, a long time, uh, places like Fandango, places like Disney, right, would look at those mobile numbers, but they'd say, well, it's growing, but it's still only 10% of the traffic, right? It's 20% of the traffic. It's 30% of the traffic. And, uh, and, and Luke Robleski, his name got cut off there, uh, I hope that I want to recommend this guy to you. I think he's an absolute genius. Uh, he, he works at Google now, uh, and he is uh, an, a real uh, guru in, in the field of uh, mobile design, also form design, two, two things. So this, is, this is his about page on his site. But he pointed out, and the article that I took this from has got a whole bunch of other moments, like when does the mobile traffic actually eclipse uh, the non-mobile traffic? And that's happened for almost everybody in the world by now. Right? It happened in Fendango, to Fendango a little bit later than it happened to Facebook, but they were the leading indicator, right? Somewhere in, uh, in 2011, uh, that happened. So, okay, my dream of bigger and bigger and better and better screens, right, is now, is now totally dashed. But not only is it totally dashed, but now, like I said at the beginning, fundamentally you have this problem just comes back and, and kicks you in the butt, which is, uh, I, this is funny. This is this is from the uh, this is from the Wikipedia page on screen resolution, and I dare you to try to figure out what the hell this is telling you. Um, it's not not really true. You can you can kind of suss it out as you think about it, but it's just to show like how confusing this is. But I, but I got a couple. Here's an example I like better. If you think, oh, I'm just designing for the Apple ecosystem, right? Let me let me look at big monitors and iPads and and phones, and, and that looks really great. But if you're not familiar with the Android ecosystem, let me tell you something. That is a totally different animal. Here's a similar picture. This is, this is a, a diagram that was created by tracking screen sizes from user traffic for something like a month, I think, at this site at OpenSignal. Here's the Android. Uh, if you add all of the screen resolutions in, this is, this is what you've got. So that's really difficult, right? You basically have to figure out a way. You're either going to be responsive or adaptive. There's no other choice you're probably going to be responsive and adaptive. So, responsive and adaptive. Let me ask you a different question. So when mobile was sort of coming up, we asked ourselves, well, is there such a, people talked about the mobile context, right? There was this idea that people, that our users, our guests, right, use their mobile phones for some kinds of things, and their laptops and their desktops for other kinds of things, right? Like, and it's and you can make sense, right? It's a little story you tell yourself about. I mean, we all know, right? It's hard to type, right? It's hard to fill out forms. People don't want to do complicated transactions on their phones if they don't have to. But the answer is, in general, there's no such thing as the mobile context. So we built um, this is uh, an early app from, from 2012 for Disney World, and it was completely designed with the idea that users were going to use it inside of the park. That's, exact, that's all that it's for. How do you get around in the park? Uh, the most important questions that people ask, or even the two most, most frequently asked questions are uh, at, at Disneyland or, or Disney World inside of a park. Bathrooms are one. ATMs are the other one. So we launched this app, and we were like, this is great. But we didn't really have great connectivity in the parks, for one thing. But for another thing, Disney fans didn't care that we said they should get this app into the park. Consistently from day one, 70% of the users were outside of the parks. So you can talk yourself into things. There's a mobile context. This is how people like to use this, their phones. 
That's not really true. That's not, uh, if you think about your own uh, life, right? Uh, uh, I, I believe this is pretty universal. You use whatever screen you have handy, right? If you've got a phone, you use a phone. If you've got a tablet, you use a tablet. Sometimes you use multiple screens. How many people, by the way, I'm curious about this, have got multiple screens on them right now? How many have two screens? Right, how many have three? A tablet, a phone, a laptop? No? I got three. No? I'm the weirdo. All right. I'm the outlier. Who knew? But sometimes, as designers, there is a mobile context. Sometimes, if you focus on the behavior of your guests, your users, and you actually study what they do when they do it, you can pick out moments in a customer journey where mobile makes sense as a context. And at Bedango, uh, the example of that is something we built called Mobile Ticket. So uh, Fandango, uh, you guys are familiar with them, they just went down again with the latest Star Wars movie, but uh, back in the news for, for not the right thing. Fandango is like a ticket middleman, right? They don't, they don't run theaters, they sell tickets for theaters. The theaters have their own operations, or how they, the, the exhibitors have their own operations, right? They, they take tickets and money in a certain place, and sometimes they have a kiosk, and sometimes you have to pick up your tickets at the like concession stand. Sometimes you have to wait in the same line as everybody else, right? This is, and so we thought about how can we differentiate? How can we make a design difference to the customers so that they get actually an advantage from having bought a ticket on Fandango? And so we basically came up with this idea. This is in the app context, right? So, so, so it's it's uh, it's it's easier. Uh, because you can take advantage of the, of the hardware and the features on the phone to say, I know exactly where you are, I know that you bought a ticket for this movie, so if I know that your phone that, and you bought a ticket for this movie are in this, are in this space, right, I can give you a screen <laughs> that lets you go directly to the ticket taker, skip the kiosk, skip the concession stand, skip whatever thing they have that tells you where to get your Fandango ticket, Take your phone and just walk up, and there's a neat little animation where the ticket taker can kind of swipe through. It's almost like tearing a ticket, kind of, kind of similar. So there's no such thing as a general mobile context, right? Users, all of us, basically expect to be connected to the internet and using some kind of screen 24 seven, right? Does that make sense? That's what you guys all expect, right? Right. Okay, but. As designers, you can pick out those moments when somebody is going to be using their phone, and you can design for those moments. Now, here's an interesting thing. As we talk about responsive versus adaptive, you think to yourself, like, well, what's the most important? What's the most important factor there? Is it those different screen sizes? And that's what a lot of the writing is about, right? How do you adapt your design to these different resolutions? But here's a funny thing. So at Fandango, we built uh, interfaces for smart TVs. The resolution is the least problem that you have on this. The big, what's the biggest problem you think designing as a designer trying to do a screen design for a, a smart TV? Well, there's lots of them, but I'll tell you my favorite one, which is the stupid D-pad controller, right? You navigate a website on your smart TV by going up, down, left, and right, right? So, just to go back, when you're thinking about responsive versus adaptive, right, you can't just think about screen size, you have to think about the input. One of the biggest, right, like one of the biggest differences that mobile uh, and, and touch screens uh, made in the, in the entire online design field. Does anybody, can anybody think of like a big difference that a touch screen makes between uh, what you can do on a, on a mobile device versus what you can do on a, a non touch screen? Well, we used to do all these things called hovers. Right? There are all these behaviors where you could hover your mouse over an element and something would sort of pop up. You can't do that with a finger on a capacitive screen. That makes no sense. A touch uh, goes directly into the screen. Uh, so that input changes uh, the design. So it's not really a matter of responsive versus adaptive. It's actually both at the same time. Because the screens are getting bigger and bigger and smaller and smaller at the same time, right? Like everything's just like, it's, 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 it's exploding. Uh, at Fandango, I got to work on a, on, a, on a wearable, on a watch app, right? And uh, here's, another, here's another screen that, that is too embarrassing, hard to look at now. So, so it's, I blame Apple because 
the way Apple works, right? They, they secret messages were sent to Fandango. Hey, we want to build this thing for this thing. We haven't really said what it is yet. And we had to send designers up there, and they couldn't talk to us about what they were working on, even though they worked for us. It was really strange. But as we worked through, we had this idea. We still were, uh, uh, we still have this idea that you were going to scroll on your on your watch, right? Like we, we said, we'll just we'll take the screens and we'll take the responsive approach and we'll just shrink that we'll just shrink that screen down even more. Um, but the truth is, is nobody really gets down to these uh, third screens down here, right? People don't tend to scroll that much. How many of you have a watch, just a smart watch? Yeah, do we know what I'm talking about? Um, but anyway, it's embarrassing. Don't do it this way. Just do one screen at a time when you, when you get down to the wearable context. Which technically would make it adaptive design rather than responsive design. Right? You've got to really think about what am I going to put on that one little tiny screen that I've got to work with. And think about it as we go along, right? It's like there's going to be screens on microwaves, right? Popcorn machines and, and who knows what uh, that you're going to have to uh, design for. So the bottom line, not a very satisfying answer, but a very typical design answer, right, is the question, the answer to the question, responsive versus adaptive, is it depends, right? It depends on all the things I talked about already, right? I, I would say right now, responsive is your baseline. If you look out there at the world, you will find 90% of everybody doing at least responsive design, and some people doing adaptive design. If I go all the way back to that original diagram, and I tried to puzzle out why this was since we started talking about it, right? Because if you read the literature, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem there's some debate about what is easier to do, right? What's easier to do? To create one design that can flex to all those dimensions, or to create multiple designs that are adapted to particular dimensions? In some ways, it seems like as a designer, it's easier to do the second one. But the problem, I believe, is uh, what you do in essence there is create multiple code bases. So it's not the problem of designing it the first time, it's the problem of every time something changes on one of those devices that you, that you design for, you end up having to redo everything uh, in your design. And that's why responsive is winning, why it's the baseline of what you do, is because once, it's harder to get it done right the first time, but once it's done, you've got a design system that flexes and adapts, and you just usually have to tweak it uh, to make sure it's optimized for particular screens. So, as far as that goes, I have some bad news and I have some, some good news. I'm going to start with the bad news. The bad news is the situation is much worse than you think. Right? So, so right now, it's like, oh, we're, 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 in, we're in academia, right? We're so learning about these two choices of responsive versus adaptive design. Well, at Disney for a long time, and at Fandango, although it looks like they might have just uh, uh, updated this, there are lots of other in-between ugly, horrible states that, that companies and designs find themselves in. So Fandango had a desktop site, they had a mobile app, and then they had a mobile website, right? This is a choice that many companies made uh, as they were watching that mobile context. So you can call that technically adaptive design, I suppose, right? The question in adaptive design is what is it exactly that you're adapting, right? You shouldn't really be, what you should not be adapting is functionality. There's nothing more annoying than thinking to yourself, oh, I knew that I could do this thing on this site, right? Like LinkedIn, for some reason, I always have this problem, right? Like, where do I do this thing? It works on the mobile site, it works on the app, but I can't do it on the web. It works on the web, but I can't do it on the app, right? That is an absolute no-no. So you don't want to think about adaptive design from a feature perspective. So you have to think about adaptive design, right? You're a designer, so you're thinking about adaptive design from a, uh, a visual perspective. But really the leading edge of adaptive design is more about the content and adapting your content. So, two case studies. Um, the first case study is uh, Cox News, which uh, in 2012 uh, started a program where they, uh, uh, they had every, um, uh, uh, every design was done at least twice, for a mobile site and for uh, a, a tablet. And they thought, that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna optimize for those two conditions, and the designers produce designs for those two uh, platforms. 
And yet, year after year, their sales of the tablet subscriptions fell uh, compared to what they did online. NPR took a different approach. NPR said, we're going to not worry about the way that this looks, and we're going to make our content adaptive. So they created an API right, uh, that lets anybody take headlines and short descriptions and long descriptions of the stories and display it however they want. And they sort of took this, let a thousand uh, uh, followers in the loop. Right? They basically made it so that anybody could take their content and adapt it how they want it, instead of having to figure out how to adapt that content to all the different uses of, of, of use cases. <coughs> and then, get ready, because never mind responsive versus adaptive, right? The latest, the biggest trend is the no UI is the best UI. Right? Conversational interfaces. This is the thing we're going to be arguing about next year. Right? AI-inspired chatbots. Right? Voice commands. Everybody's running to get uh, what's you know between Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple. Right? This is every, this is the this is the forefront of the design uh, battle going on right now. So this is why I say when you think about adaptive design, this is why you want to think about adaptive design in terms of your content. Because the content can be delivered through a voice interface. Your designs cannot really be delivered through a voice interface. Right? So once a lot of designs, uh, once a lot of interfaces, once as we get more and more used to talking to our computers, I still feel a little odd. I actually got a, an Amazon Echo for the office because I thought uh, we're, we're gonna, we have to get used to this idea of talking out loud to our computers. It, it feels odd. Um, then I immediately had to turn off the buying because guys kept coming by and be like, order underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Um, but, so a year from now, right, the question of responsive versus adaptive will start to seem a little quaint, a little bit of looking backwards into history, right, in terms of like, sort of like my progressive enhancement versus, uh, and, uh, no, uh, yeah, graceful degradation, right, like loss to the, to the, to the, to the veil of history. Because the UI is like, do you have a UI or do you not have a UI? Right? Are you responding or adapting to that? That being said, the future is bright for designers, right? Design thinking. Designers, designers who solve problems, designers who make choices, designers who want to make the world a better place. I often uh, tell people that I work with, they're always worried about the designers uh, being so cranky. Right? When we have design meetings, right, and people like really get, they raise their voices and they tell, they call other people's designs bullshit, right? And it's sort of like gets really feisty. And the business people or the marketing people will say, like, ooh, that was a really terrible meeting, right? And you know, Carrie, you know what I'm talking about. And, the, and, and we would say, no, that was a really great meeting, right? <laughs> Designers are cranky because we can see a better world. We know that this crappy world we're living in doesn't have to be this way. Everything can be better. So we're cranky all the time. That crankiness is actually a good thing because the world that we're moving into, right, think about it again, take a big step back historically, and by that I just mean maybe 50, 100 years, 200 years, right? What we are is we're actually moving into a world of ubiquitous computing. And this is what I want to leave you with, which is one of my all time favorite designers, uh, uh, aside from Walt Disney, probably my biggest inspiration is Buckminster Fuller. I don't know if you're familiar, some of you are. You should, you should look him up. But he had this concept uh, way in the 30s called ephemeralization. And this is what I think of. I think of no UI that immediately brings it to mind, right? Technology, we've been in the era, right, where technology is clamped, these designs and these screens are clamoring for your attention, right? Everybody's got a pop up ad, like, give me your email, right? Sign up now. You can't do anything until you create an account, right? All this technology is trying to dominate your attention. But, as we enter the world of ephemeralization, of ubiquitous computing, technology is going to calm down. Technology is going to fade into the background. Right? Because we have the ability to do more and more with, with less and less. Where I work now at Philosophy, we can do more in a four-week project than the teams I work with at Fandango could do in three months. That, just a plain fact. I love the people I work with at And at Disney, it was probably six to 12 months, by the way. There, you know, there's, there's some good reasons for that and some bad reasons for that. But we're entering this world of ubiquitous computing, right? Computing power is everywhere. 
Screens are everywhere. Voice systems that are listening to you talk are everywhere, or will be everywhere. Right? It's not hard to imagine where this is going to go. So as designers, this is why design thinking, this is why designers are so hot right now. Because the technology, unless you're working in the forefront of technology, unless you're working on you know, individual uh, uh, IP creation out of, a, out of a scientific university or at a Google or a, a Microsoft or an Amazon, places that can afford to spend millions of dollars on R&D, right? they're doing all this R&D and all that technology is trickling down to us, which means that most businesses, most organizations, most entities, most people have the ability to do things now that would have been unimaginable just a decade ago or two decades ago. Right? Just think of how old and crappy that first Walt Disney World site looks. That was not that long ago, guys. It was not that long ago. So design is the leading edge of innovation. Design is the leading edge of how you differentiate yourself, your service, your product, your business, your institution. And designers, you guys have that ability to change the world. And so your life is not easy. Your life is terrible. I didn't even get into the fact that you never get that nobody has ever said to me, well, Chris, you're a designer. You obviously know best. How should we do this? Right? That's not what they say. They say, hey, can you make this look pretty? And I say, uh, you know, that's not what I do, right? I don't, I don't make things just look pretty. That's pretty demeaning. And they say, yeah, I know, but people just make this look pretty. Right? Mostly what you're caught in is a world between business and techno technological forces. So I was talking earlier about that, hey, at Fandango, we had a mobile website. We had a whole website that was built just around the idea of serving up to mobile devices. It was terrible, and uh, we all hated it, but to replace it would have been nine months and a, and a million and a half dollars. And so guess what? We lived with it, right? Um, so as designers, you don't get to rule the world yet. But as technology becomes more and more ubiquitous and more and more visible, we will eventually rule the world. And I think our day is coming. So thank you very much.